Welcome to Girl, We Gotta Talk. I'm your host, Elena Jakes. This podcast is a lifestyle and entertainment news podcast where I talk all about life struggles, the breakups, the makeups, business aspirations, and I am always having new guests on to discuss it all. Plus, I'm always giving you the latest on all things pop culture. So let's jump into today's episode because, girl, we gotta talk. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Girl, We Gotta Talk. Today, I'm joined by Natalie Barbu. She is a YouTuber, a fellow podcast host, and a businesswoman. And today, we're just going to talk about her journey on YouTube, her company, the Barbu Agency, and so much more. Um, So thank you so much for coming on, Natalie. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. Awesome. I kind of wanted to um, let you introduce yourself a little bit better so that people listening who don't know you can get to know you a little bit more before we jump in. So if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah. So my name's Natalie and I've been doing YouTube for about nine years now. So I started when I was 15 years old, really bored at home and had like my MacBook laptop and like started recording a makeup tutorial on it. And that's kind of how it began. So I didn't really realize that it could be a business. I didn't know that I would be doing it almost 10 years later, Um, but I really loved it. And so I kept doing that throughout high school and in college. And I really started treating it more like a business, I would say in college when I started taking it more seriously and realizing like this could be something bigger than just like a fun little hobby. So I did that in college. And after college, I actually got a job with Accenture, which is like a pretty big consulting firm. And I was really excited to have that job, but it was really time consuming doing YouTube and full-time corporate job. Um, And I also wanted to do so many more things with my YouTube channel. Like I didn't just want to do YouTube and that was it. Like I wanted to start a podcast and I wanted to start like a business. And so I was just getting really overwhelmed with doing both. So I actually decided to quit my job about nine months into working. And I, that was May of last year that I quit. So been about a year and a half now. And so now I have a podcast. I have um, my agency that I started, which started out as like consultations and kind of grew into an agency, which was always like the original plan for it. Um, But yeah, and now I'm here today. So that's pretty much like the past nine years of my life. (laughs) Just in a quick two minutes. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And we're going to kind of jump into like basically everything that you just mentioned, because I want to know how um, like quitting your job was like, and just like all of your different like business ventures right now. Um, But before we get into it, I kind of like to do like rapid fire questions. So I just have a few, um, if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, what is your favorite food currently? Oh, um, right now I'm loving like all the fall food. So like the butternut squash soup and like autumn soup and like all of these like pumpkin things. I know it's very basic, but like I love all of like, <laughs> like those bisques and stuff like that. So definitely more like festive fall food. Okay. Did you do like the Trader Joe's like, let me get everything fall related? Cause I was one of those people, unfortunately. <laughs> I love their like soups. So like I'm a big soup person. So like all their bisques and everything like yeah. that, like that's what I pretty much got. And then I got a few other like random like breads or like random little pumpkin flavored things, but yeah. that was it for the most part. Okay. Um, what is one thing that annoys you? Um, I think when people don't take me seriously is something that really annoys me. Like when it's like, oh, uh, you just do YouTube or you you just do Instagram. Like that's like nothing, you know, like yeah. when they're kind of condescending in that way, or if they're like, oh, you're just really young, you don't know what you're talking about, or you know, like things like that annoy me a lot. When it's like they automatically kind of are condescending or like disrespectful from the beginning without getting to know you. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, I would be annoyed too. Um, (laughs) what is your favorite TV show? Um, right now I'm rewatching gossip girl and (laughs) I'm one of those people that just like rewatches TV shows. Yeah. So I'm rewatching that, but my favorite TV show is probably either Grey's Anatomy or even though I do think that it needs to end, I think it's gone on for way too long. Or I really like How to Get Away with Murder a lot, too. So those are some of my top ones. But right now, I just finished Emily in Paris, and now I'm watching Gossip Girl again. What are your thoughts on Emily in Paris? I haven't started it, but I feel like there's mixed reviews. 
Yeah, I think it was one of those shows that like it had high expectations and it was good. Like I liked and like I enjoyed watching it, but it was one of those shows that like me and my friend were talking about this has a very childish a script like the script is very very immature and childish but then they sneak in like a really mature joke so it's like re- wanting to relate to like older people but like the rest of the show sounds like it could be for middle schoolers so okay. we were just like very confused we're like this the script is very childish but then they'll sneak in a joke that's like a sex joke or like a dirty joke and I'm like oh like a 13 year old shouldn't be watching this never mind yeah. but like the rest of the show sounds like it could be for like a middle schooler so yeah that's that's odd it's good like to like really, pass the time <laughs> yeah <laughs> lily collins is so good that i kind of heard that too like it's just the writing was just off like something was just like weird about it and lily collins didn't know how to be like not a very serious actor because i feel like she's in super dark serious movies mm-hmm. and this was like woo i don't know yeah Does that makes sense yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think it's good to watch. Um, and I do wish that they had like more Paris shots. Like I was okay. talking to my friend about this too. And it was like, I wanted to watch it because I wanted to like see Paris and like, I don't know, like I love Paris. So I like wanted to watch it for that reason. And it just felt like it was filmed on a set. Like it didn't feel like, like they didn't oh. show Paris that much. It was just like, they showed little locations and like the same locations in every episode that I was like, this could have been filmed on, like, an L.A. movie set, and no one would have known, so, like, I wish they, like, showed Paris more. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, Okay, well, that kind of leads into the next one. What is your favorite place that you've traveled to, and what's one place that you want to travel to? Oh, I really do love Paris. That's, like, one of my definitely favorite cities that I've been. It's, like, very hit or miss. I feel like people either hate it or they love it, and I love it. I think it's really beautiful, and, like, the architecture is so pretty, and, like, there's just something so magical about Paris, I feel like. So I personally really love it. Um, but someplace I really want to go is Greece. I have never been, so I'd love to go to Greece. Yeah, Greece is mine too. It's like Italy and Greece are my top two places I like need to be. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. okay, last one. What? Who is your celebrity crush? Um, who is my celebrity crush? Uh, I mean, I always, like, when I was younger, I loved, like, Justin Bieber and, like, all of that, um, but right now, I honestly, like, don't think I even, like, have a celebrity crush. There's just so many that I think are, like, attractive or, like, yeah. look nice, but I don't have, like, one specific. I was writing that, and I was, like, okay, I, I don't think I have, there's not, like, one person I'm, like, oh, my gosh. Well, I guess Zac Efron's always been <laughs> yeah. fine from, like, day one, but, like, I'm not like drooling over him now, but yeah, I don't know. I think I know. Like, older, you don't think about it anymore. Is that is that normal? I don't know. I know. I feel like now it's like I'll see someone and I'm like, ooh, they're like hot, or they're attractive, or something, or I'll, like really like their personality on yeah. whatever I see them on. Like I was really into like the NBA finals this year just because we were from Miami, and so like Miami Heat was in the finals, and so yeah. my whole family like was watching that. And there's like J- Jimmy Butler and like Tyler Hero on the team, and I'm like, oh my god, I love them. <laughs> So, like, right now, those are my celebrity crushes, but just because it's so recent that I've, like, yeah. been seeing them. <laughs> That's awesome. Those are good ones, too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, those are all the questions. So, we can kind of just get into – I want to talk about, like, your YouTube channel. And you kind of said it in the beginning, but I want to know, like, when you decided to, like, start it and, like, why – I guess you kind of did mention that, but – um what was, like, the driving force in being, like, okay, I think I need to, like, I want to do this. Yeah, so I started it nine years ago, like I said, and I really honestly did it out of boredom. I feel like all my friends had like sports that they went to after school and all of them had like clubs that they went to. And I was so uninvolved in like school that I didn't, I didn't like play sports in high school. So I didn't have like practice to go to, or I didn't have those types of things that I would do to like pass the time. So after school, I would do YouTube videos and I would make those and like that was the way I like passed the time and like did something extra, I guess. And I did it just because I was obsessed with like Bethany Moda and like Juicy Sorrow 7. I think oh Bethany God. Moda was actually after I started, but so I started with like Juicy Sorrow 7 and like Claudia Saluski and like all of those girls that I loved. And so I was like, I think, I mean, they look like me. Like, I feel like I can do it. Like they're like my same age. Like I, this doesn't look that hard. Yeah. So I was like, I'll just try this out. And so that's how I started. And I remember getting a few views and a few comments. And I was like, oh my God, this is so weird. Cause this is even before social media. Like Facebook was a thing, but it was like oh, yeah. only your friends, you know? 
like Instagram wasn't even like created yet. Like Instagram wasn't even a thing yet. So like this is before any form of social media where random people could find you. And I remember seeing like comments and views and being like, this is so crazy that like random people are following me and like watching me. And I remember getting 100 subscribers in like two months or something like that. And I remember doing a giveaway and I was like, this is the best day of my life. Like I can't believe a hundred people subscribe to my channel. Like yeah. it was just, it was really, really just like innocent at first. Like I just really thought this was cool new medium online. And then um, in college, I was like, okay, people are moving to LA and doing YouTube full time. There's definitely like money in this. There's definitely like something like this, this is a business, you know? And so I was like, okay, I need to start being serious about it. Cause in high school, I would like, there was at one point I filmed like five videos in one year. Like I wasn't really consistent on it at all. And so once I got to high school or once I got to college, I was like, I need to start like actually doing this because I feel like this could turn into something. And like, by the time I graduate, who knows what this could be. So uh, that's kind of was like mentality, my mentality starting it. Yeah. It's so interesting when you say like Juicy Star 07, like that's when I found YouTube and I was like obsessed with them and like Claudia and Bethany Moda, like that's crazy that like I'm almost forgetting that like that was a period of time because YouTube has changed so much. And it's weird that you say that there wasn't Instagram because I can't think of a time that there wasn't Instagram. Mm -hmm. And it's weird that you joined YouTube and you weren't able to be like, guys, like on your Instagram, you weren't like able to like promote it. I know. That's so bizarre. And even my Instagram, I remember when I first got it in high school, I was, I like didn't tell anyone about my YouTube channel because I was so embarrassed. So like none of my friends knew. I didn't even tell my mom until like three months later. Like I didn't tell anyone that I started because I was just like so embarrassed or so like nervous about it. And so people in my high school slowly started finding out. And I remember like being so mortified because they would kind of like make fun of me for it and like tease me and like play the video in like groups of friends and like at parties. And it was just like, so I was like, Oh my God, it's so embarrassing. Um, so I didn't want to tell anyone. So like on my Instagram, I didn't have anything promoting YouTube. I even, I remember getting, so I was like a part of the 17 magazine, like style council where they would feature you in the magazine. And so I had like a full page spread on like my fashion and whatever. And so they had like my link to my blog, which at the time was a Tumblr, which is so funny, but (laughs) it was my Tumblr. And I remember having my YouTube channel in my Tumblr and I took it off because I was like, I don't want people from my high school, like finding my YouTube channel. So I'm like, now I wish I would have left it on because I'm sure it would have like gotten me a lot of subscribers, but I like took it off because I was so embarrassed about doing YouTube that I like did not want anyone to know. Like I didn't tell people until my freshman year of college. That's so weird that like, I think that's such a common thing with YouTubers, especially people that started back when it wasn't as like, I don't know, common because yeah. people didn't know how others would react to it. And it's pretty, I feel like it's sad because you should be proud of it. And like, I mean, look at you now, you're obviously very successful with it. So it's like, why are people judging you in the first place for it? And like yeah. sharing it at parties, really? Uh, I know. I'm sorry that that <laughs> happened. Cause that's super annoying. Um, I, so like you started off doing like makeup tutorials and stuff. How do you think like your channel has like grown and from like when you started to now and is it kind of still the same type of videos or are you like targeting different um like topics and like audiences yeah so I think YouTube has shifted I mean a ton since I started like when I started it was the like my username was beauty by nat xo and I didn't want like my last name anywhere and no one had their names (laughs) yeah people didn't want to share their names and like it wasn't it was so not personal like it was very very just like I'm coming to your channel to watch YouTube, to watch like a makeup tutorial. And like, that's it. Like, it wasn't like a personal thing at all. And so now I feel like, I feel like it's like gotten more personal as the years have gone on and like people are sharing their lives and they're sharing their vlogs. And like, sometimes it's even like too open. Like people are sharing everything online. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just that complete shift of like not showing your name, not showing anything, just showing this like one little tiny part. And now it's like, everything's out in the open. So my channel's definitely shifted that way too. And I've like kept up with that. So I really do love how personal it is, but I am still trying to create that boundary of like, okay, what am I sharing and what am I not? Because I don't think it's healthy to put everything online. I think it's, you need to have some things that are sacred. You need to have some things that are for yourself only, you know? So right. it's one of those like balances now where I'm like, I want to tell my subscribers everything because I do feel like we are friends, but it's also very, uh, I don't know, like scary to put everything out there. And I don't necessarily think everything should be out there. 
Yeah. And I think a lot with like YouTubing or YouTubers now is, yeah, like you want to be open and like people are coming to your channel because they like you. So you want to be like transparent. So I feel like, yeah, it's got to be tough to not share like every aspect of your life with them without not, without feeling like you're like lying about things because you're not telling your subscribers and stuff. So, um, but I do feel like you are very honest in your YouTube videos and you're very like genuine, like you come across very genuine. Um, so I think that's also like tough to, it's like, even if you are trying to be genuine, it's hard to come across that way because mm -hmm. you're still talking to a camera and you're still like on YouTube. So it's like a weird, like, right. I want to be your friend kind of situation. But I think a lot of your videos are um, really informative. Like, I feel like you like to like inspire and teach your subscribers. So is that kind of what, cause there's like a lot of like finance videos and like how to be successful and things like that. Is that kind of what you um, are like working towards now is to just like help everyone that's like watching your videos? Yeah. I mean, I always want to provide value and I always think like, I never want to vlog for the sake of just like vlogging. Like there will be some vlogs that are like that. Like a weekend in my life is not really going to be informative. It's just like pure entertainment, but I do want most of my videos and most of my channel to be informative, to be helpful in some way, to provide some sort of value because one, again, like I said, I want to have boundaries. I don't want to show like my entire life. Like I, I want you to think that I'm showing a lot and think I'm showing my life, but still have things reserved for myself because just like for your mental health, I think that that's really healthy. Um, but I do want to always like provide that value. So instead of like I'm compensating for, instead of showing everything, I'm really just showing the stuff that matters or like the, the stuff that's actually going to help you or, you know, like I'll take you through a work day, but like, I'm not going to show you if I'm like out to dinner with my family, you know? So like, Things like that is what I've been trying to do more. And I really like that my channel has been providing value for people rather than just like pure entertainment. Cause I feel like for me, I don't think I would like that if I, that was like what my channel was. So I always, always, always try to like answer people's questions, answer people's DMs, like make a video if like people are asking the same question over and over again, you know? So that's like something that I really like doing on my channel. Yeah. And I think that's great. Cause I don't think a lot of YouTubers do that. I think it's really become like a vlogging space. Like it's just people vlogging their days, which is fine. And like, it's entertaining to watch, but I think you bring a lot of value to your channel with like having those types of videos. I'm sure you deal with some sort of criticism, but how do you deal with like criticism that you get from like random people that watch you on the internet? Cause it's gotta be like, you don't even know me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, again, why I have set up so many boundaries because like, I don't want those people to affect me and I feel like when you are very very vulnerable online it's like you're way more of an easy target for people to like I guess like criticize you or like hate on you or whatever um I think it goes in waves of like not caring at all what people think and then all of a sudden if I get a few hate comments I'll start caring way more and then I have to like bring myself down and be like no no no, it's fine like don't care so it's like it's yeah. a bunch of waves that I go through and like it's easy to say that, oh, I don't, I don't even care about them. Like they don't know me, like whatever, but I mean, it affects you. Like if someone's talking bad about you and they're DMing you or they're like talking about you in your comments or whatever, like you read those and like, of, of course they're going to like affect you somehow. So I just think for me, I try to really either limit reading things like that. Like I try not to read every single thing that comes my way because I just don't think it's that healthy. And then also if someone is like, saying something that I just know is not true I'm just like okay that's not my problem to like set them straight like yeah. I have so many people that don't believe that and I hope that in my videos I just show that that's not the case so I'll just continue like showing my true character but if that person thinks that then there's nothing I can do and also I've realized a lot of people that hate online that like are just have like troll accounts or they have like spam accounts where they just like dm hate to other people I feel like those people are so unhappy in their lives and they're going to do that no matter what you do. Like if you're, if they're like, oh, I hate your videos because of X, Y, Z. And all of a sudden you stop doing that just to please them. They're going to find something else to hate about you. Say something else. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to find like something else that it's going to, they're going to like be like, oh, well, I don't like this actually. Or like, oh, well, you're so rude for doing that. So I think it's like, you can't please them. So you might as well just like not try. <laughs> like, yeah. One exactly. of those where you can't care what they think. Yeah. I think that's a good mindset to have because I think a lot of people, I mean, even people that aren't YouTubers deal with criticism. Um, 
from other people. And like, even if you're hearing it from somebody else or whatever it is, like at the end of the day, you have to have the mindset of like, they're saying that because they're not happy. Um, and maybe they have insecurities about that. And so they are just trying to like deflect and put that on you. And it's just not your problem. Don't look at it, but it's hard. Cause I think like when you see like a bunch of really nice comments and you're like, Oh my gosh, like I love this. I'm like, I'm so happy people like the video or whatever it is. And then you see like the one like negative, it's hard to like overlook Mm -hmm. that. But I think that's a good mindset to have for sure. Yeah. And like, also I feel like people get a lot of hate for deleting comments. People will get hate on deleting hate comments. Like you literally can't do anything right. So it's one of those things where (laughs) it's like, if someone, for example, my channel, my Instagram, like that's my space. Like that is my home, you know, if you will, like, I'm not going to have someone on there that is going to post really mean things or bring like really toxic energy there or say things that are just completely not true, you know? So I don't feel bad for like deleting comments or deleting, you know? And of course, like, I think there's a difference between constructive criticism and hate comments, you know, like, because I do like to take criticism into account because there are some things that I do that I'm like, oh, okay, this person's right. Like, I shouldn't do that or I should, that might be annoying or that maybe what I said was offensive, you know? So like, I'll take that into account and I'm not going to delete comments for that way. But like, if someone's just like, I hate you and you're ugly or something like that, like, there's no point in having that on there. Because that just like, it also snowballs. Like when someone sees one mean thing, then they like all contribute to it. So I'd rather just not have that on there. And then if you want to write about it, you can write about it somewhere else. But like, it's not going to be on my stuff. Yeah. I kind of want to get your, uh, your take on cancel culture. I think um, that is a huge issue right now. And I'm seeing it a lot with people on YouTube. Unfortunately, like people say one thing and like they are like, they're out. Like people are just absolutely like tearing them to shreds mm-hmm. and they're losing a lot of like followers and stuff. What do you like, what are your thoughts on cancel culture in general? Yeah. So I did like a whole video on cancel culture where I talk about how there's a difference between like accountability and cancel culture where I think it's good to hold people accountable. And I think it is good to like call someone out if they're doing something wrong. But I think it becomes some like you don't need 3,000, 5,000 people to tell you you've done that one thing wrong, you know, because then that's just like, that affects the other person's mental health as well. And it also makes them not want to grow or change as a person. If you're just like attacking them and forcing them to kind of hide and like go away and like, you're not even giving them a chance to redeem themselves. So I think that accountability is right in the way where it's like, okay, you address something to them and they should like take the time to respond with like whatever they think or an apology or something. But cancel culture, I feel like is when it goes too far or where like anything that someone says is like, you're done because I didn't like that where it's like you can also unfollow someone you cannot watch them you know like if it if you don't like that person like you don't have to like that person like there's going to be so many people that don't like me and that's totally fine because I don't like everyone like if there's not like I'm not like oh my god I love everyone and that's it like there's some people that I really don't like but I'm not going to choose to watch them or like be in their lives, you know? Right, yeah. So I think that cancel culture, it's like, you should take a step back and just like unfollow them and unsubscribe if you really don't like them. But when you're constantly making fake accounts over people, when you're spreading rumors, when you are emailing every single sponsor and telling them that they need to um, quit, like no, stop working with them when you're getting them, you know, like all of these contacting people in their life, when you're stalking them at their homes, you know, those types of things, it's like, you can't do that. Like, that's not Okay even if someone did something wrong, like, I just don't think that that's okay. I think cancel culture would actually be more effective and would work better if everyone just stopped watching someone rather than just like giving them hate, you know? So I think it's one of those things where it's like, if you really don't like them and they really did something that you don't like, just like stop watching them and that's it. But like harassing them and bullying them, I don't think it's going to do anything. And like, you have to give people a chance to like learn and correct themselves as well. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, um, I think a lot of people take it way too far. I mean, ultimately you're like ruining somebody's like livelihood, like you're, and if this, if it's a YouTube situation, like you're ruining like their job, like this is their income, like this is how they make a living. Um, not to like say that like whatever they did was like, okay, but I agree with you on the accountability thing. Like, I think as long as the way that you're 
criticizing or saying like, hey, you know, what you said offended me or what you said is offensive in general. Like, here's how you should have said it. Or here's, you know, some, like, here's some information to like learn more about whatever it is. I think that's a better way of Mm -hmm. dealing with the problem because like, you know what I mean? This is somebody's life. And I think nobody can grow and learn unless you give them the tools to do it instead of like shutting them out and canceling them. And like the fact that people will like reach out to people's sponsorships reach out to people's like jobs, organizations that they're they're in or whatever it is. Like that's sad to me. I think Mm -hmm. that just takes it way too far. Like these are people's lives. So, right. um, And I I mean, I, I also think like there are some people that have done really, really horrible things that people shouldn't support anymore. You know, like there is a line between like, oh, they just offended me and like, okay, this is actually like really troubling and like, yeah, this person's like not okay. You know? So I, I do think that, but I still think like harassing someone and like constantly, messaging them and like DMing them or like showing up places, you know, like that's just never okay. I feel yeah. like. No, there's definitely, there's definitely, um, variations of like, yeah, <laughs> I understand what you're saying. Like there's definitely like some people are like, okay, yeah, this needs to not happen like ever. Um, but yeah, I just think it's interesting, especially the last few years about cancel culture and how people like will come back from it too. It's just so interesting. And if they do come back, um, how they handle it. And just, it's just such a new way of like thinking of like, okay, well this person said this, so they're canceled. Like, it's just weird. It's just so bizarre. Um, I just wanted to get your, your take on it. I want to jump into uh, talking about, um, the Barbu agency and kind of why you decided to start it and just your goals for it in general. Yeah. So we're currently in like a weird pivot stage where, we have a few clients and we like really, really love our clients, but we're really trying to hone in on our more, um, being more like specific and being more strategic with how we move forward with it. So right now it's me. And then I have also Hani who's on my team and she's amazing. She's like, she started as an intern, but now she's just part-time working with me and she's like so awesome, but we're trying to really re-strategize with how we want to like move forward with this and how we want to like gain clients in the future because we've had a few clients already and like they've taught me so much of what I like and what I don't like you know it's like some things that I'm doing I'm like wait I really don't like this and I don't think this is like my skill set so I'm not going to include this going forward or like yeah there's some things that I absolutely love and I'm like I want to get more clients that want to focus on this so now we're trying to like piece that all together and create this new strategy so it'd still be like an agency but just a more clear-cut vision with it so what I'm starting out to do is like everyone's going to get like an intro call. And then from there, we kind of pick like, okay, what's the best strategy for you to grow like and get your audience like get your desired audience? Because the way I think of it is that what my goal is, is to make brands kind of treat their marketing strategies, kind of how influencers treat their marketing strategies, and like their marketing tactics. Because I think that influencers have shown that we can connect to an audience on audience, tr- like our audience trusts us. We're like their friends. And I feel like brands have that disconnect where it's like, oh, this big brand, like I don't trust them. I don't, I might like your product, but like, I don't have a connection with the brand. And so I really want to make brands have a connection with their audience and like reach their desired audience and actually have that trust with them. So that's kind of what we're doing. And that's what we're kind of hoping for. And that's what I wanted when I started. I I've always thought there was just such a disconnect between brands and like their audience. And then there's such a connection with influencers and their audience. So, but influencers are running a business just like brands are. So I was like, how can we connect it? And how can we like make brands also have that connection with their audience? So that's how I uh, came up with it. And like, that's what I really wanted to do, but I'm going to have a copywriter write everything in a better way. Cause I feel like I'm like all (laughs) over the place for saying it. So like, I need someone to just like write this down in a very clear way. So like when someone asks me this question, like on a podcast, I have like a one sentence liner that I can actually say, but yeah, before, before I hire the copywriter, that's like what I'm thinking in my head. (laughs) Yeah, no, I think that's great. And obviously like over the years, you've learned so much about like being an influencer and like having that experience, you're just incorporating all that knowledge to this. So I think that's super Mm -hmm. smart. Um, so what do you see for the future of it? And like, do you, you know, want to grow your team or like, do you have any brands in mind that you like would love to work with or yeah, I would love to grow the team eventually. I'm, I definitely want to be smart about it and not just like 
grow it just for the sake of growing. So I really want to get like organ more organized and like have more ro- specific roles right now and stuff. So, but in the future, I would love to grow my team. And then um, I really do see it growing. Like I want to work with businesses that are kind of up and coming, like emerging businesses and kind of yeah. give them that push they need. And like, I do want to work with brands long-term. I realized even with the clients I do have, I don't really like these like one-off roles where it's like, we just need you for one influencer marketing campaign and that's it. Like, yes, I can do that. But I think that it's actually better and more beneficial for the both of us if we work on like a long-term thing and I can actually help you with like your entire social media strategy rather than just like this, like one campaign that I'm not even sure if it's going to really be that effective unless we do like a long-term thing. Like in two weeks, I don't really think I can like, skyrocket your social media and I feel like you know there's there's just so much that's so much more involved in it so that's why I'm like I really want to work with brands like long term yeah no and I think that's smart because then you have like the better relationship with them you're able to like look over like the longevity of things and see like how things worked how things didn't I think this is like a great idea that you had and I'm really glad that you started it because I think it's super smart um yeah so I want to jump in to um (laughs) <laughs> living in New York, but now living in Boston and you were in Charlotte and just like where you're at. Um, so you went to NC state, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I went to NC state and then majored in engineering there. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I want to talk about that because you entered or you majored in engineering and did you have like a clear cut goal of like what job exactly like you wanted when you graduated? Um, And did you like ever really consider doing YouTube full-time or are you always kind of in the mindset of like, I have YouTube to like have part-time, but I still want to have like that nine to five. Yeah. So when I was applying to jobs, it was early in my senior year. So I definitely could not do YouTube full-time at that point, just like financially would not have supported me. So I was really looking for a lot of jobs and like taking the job hunt very seriously. Like I didn't even really think like, oh, I can fall back on YouTube. Like that was like not even in my like thought process. So I really wanted a consulting job because I did want to work in industries that weren't just like engineering focused or related. I really wanted to do more of like the, like work in actually like corporations, like businesses and do different projects. So that's why consulting was great because you work with a ton of different businesses and you like bounce from project to project. So I really wanted something that was broad and that's why I like really, really wanted consulting and Accenture just caught my eye. I really loved the projects that they worked on. So that's how I got that job. I just like really like applied hardcore and like was like going to every single networking event that they offered and like keeping up with the recruiters. So like that was like honestly my dream corporate job. And once I got there, I realized I didn't really love it as much as I thought I would. Um, And I don't think people ever really love their first job. Like I think your first job is such a learning curve. So I'm not recommending that you quit if you don't love your first job because I don't think that's like good advice. But for me, I started doing YouTube. I was like, okay, I don't really like this job. And I have this other thing that is making me money. Let me focus a lot on this other thing, like while I'm working so I can like quit this job and then eventually do that full time. Yeah. So I was pretty much working. I mean, I was working like two full-time jobs, YouTube and, um, my corporate job. And the second I was able to quit, I was like, I'm out of here. (laughs) So, uh, eight months later I was able to quit, which is crazy. Cause like beginning of senior year was not making enough money at all to like do it full time. And then pretty much a year and a half later, I guess, no, like two, two years later, I guess I was able to like, I was making like double what I was making at my corporate job, like on YouTube, like the growth is just like so exponential. Like I feel like once it picks up, it's like a snowball effect. Okay. So when you worked with Accenture, where were you located? I was in Charlotte. So I was back at home in North Carolina. Okay. And then you decided to move to New York. Mm -hmm. So what drove you to the city? I just always loved New York City. Like that has always been my dream city to live in, like as long as I can remember. And so I really wanted to get a job in New York and Accenture has offices in New York. So I was like, oh, awesome. I'll get the job and then I'll go to the New York office. But like when I was applying, they're like, sorry, it's only for North Carolina. I was like, okay, fine. So then I stayed in North Carolina and I was like, well, I'll transfer to New York like after a little bit. And then I ended up just quitting instead because I didn't like, Right. I just didn't need to transfer. So I quit instead. And then I was like, okay, nothing is holding me back anymore. Like it's my time to move. So I ended up moving a few months after I quit my job and it was like such a good decision. And 
now it's like that one year mark where I, w- I was living in the city like a year ago today and I'm like seeing all these memories from it and it just makes me so sad because I'm like, it's not the same anymore. Like yeah. I can't do any of these things that I did a year ago um, or not most of them. So it makes me so sad, but I'm excited for the day that New York is more back to normal. Yeah, I think it's slowly getting there, but <laughs> um, New York is crazy. And even when like COVID first happened and when everyone literally cleared out of the city, it was so sad. Like the photos I was seeing, like the videos, like no one was there. Do you see yourself going back soon? Or are you kind of just waiting to see like what happens with like, COVID and stuff? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to see how the winter would be because I knew that like if there was another lockdown or if there was like, I don't know, more restrictions in place, winter in New York is not a fun place to be when you can't do anything. Like as right. much as I love the city, we have tiny apartments there. You have to take public transportation most places. So like if that's, if you can't do that anymore, then that's kind of sucks. You can't go on walks. You can't go on picnics. You can't go, you know, like there's no outdoor dining. So I was like, I don't want to pay $3,000 a month in rent to live, like not do anything. So I was like, I'm just going to go home and then I'll see in the new year, like after the cold passes, how it is. And then I'll reassess. So I'm still planning on moving back in the new year. Um, but as of now I'm like enjoying spending money or saving money. I'm enjoying saving money here. And then I can reassess when like it gets at least a little warmer. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. That's going to be so weird in the winter when like there is an outdoor dining, not even just in New York, but like everywhere. Cause like, what is like, are we all just going to eat inside again? But I feel like there's going to be another peak. I don't even know. Uh, so stressful. Yeah. So that's why I was like, I'll just move back home for now and then yeah. <laughs> see how it is. How has the adjustment been like being back home? It's been good. I mean, I thought it was, I had a lot of anxiety before moving here and like moving back. And I was just like, I don't know if I want to, like, I think I'm the type of person that with my family, it's like better relationship in doses. Like, I don't want to be with you all the time. And I love my family, but it's just one of those things where, again, like family gets complicated. Like, I don't, I don't know. I feel like our relationship is better when we have some space sometimes. So I'm like, oh, I don't want to move back home, but it's actually been a lot better than I like ever thought. So I'm very, very grateful that I even have a place to come because some people can't move back home. Like they don't even have that option. So like, I'm so thankful and grateful that I have this option and have like parents that take me in. So I'm like trying to look at all the positives and it actually hasn't been bad. So good, good. Yeah. It's definitely weird, especially when you were just like living on your own and you're independent and then you're like, okay, moving back in for a little bit. Like it is like, it's probably weird. Um, yeah. But that's good that it's been better. You are in a long distance relationship, right? Mm-hmm. So I wanted to talk about this because I kind of, I am too. I said kind of, but like we were and then we're not. So it's like, <laughs> it's a weird situation. But um, I want to know how like COVID has affected your relationship because with me, like I'm working from home. So it's a little bit easier as to like visiting. Like I'm able to just like bring a laptop and go mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, so how has like, that affected your relationship? I actually think that it's made it a little better because now we're both working from home. So I always have been able to like travel and like work from home and like that hasn't really changed. Um, But now he, my boyfriend's also able to. So he's able to visit me at home for like two weeks at a time or like we're able to go to his parents' house for a little bit or he also has a, a place, his family has a place in Florida and like my family also has a place in Florida and it's like 45 minutes away from each other. So like we can both go down there because we're both remote. Whereas like if he was in the office, we would not be able to do that. And it would be me traveling all the time. So it's actually been nicer because now we can spend longer periods with each other rather than just a weekend. And we can both, I mean, with COVID, obviously in the beginning, we weren't traveling. So I didn't see him for like a few months. So that was really hard because that was like the longest it's been without seeing him. And like, we, none of us wanted to travel. So But once things started opening up a little more, then he came, or did he come to me first or did I go to him? I think I went to him first and then he came to me, but you know, it started like being a little bit better that way. So I think after those like few months of being apart, it's actually been better than like beforehand. Yeah. Um, What is your advice for just couples in long distance or that have started long distance? Um, Because I feel like you've been like really successful with it. Thanks. Yeah. I'm so for us we did long distance the entire time where he was in oklahoma city and i was in north carolina and it was 
so annoying because like Oklahoma City has the worst flights like no there's like no <laughs> flight so everything's like a connection or it's like four hundred dollars because like no one's going there so it was just like so like that was kind of hard um doing that and we were both working corporate jobs so we both couldn't like take a ton of time off to see right. each other um but now we moved so and then he moved to Boston and I moved to New York and we got a little closer and now I'm in North Carolina again, but like, it's been a lot easier to see each other now that I'm not like working a corporate job and he's remote. So my biggest advice is just like, honestly, knowing that it is possible to work out. I feel like some people think like, oh my God, long distance never works, but like, I don't think that's true. And I think it's just one of those things where just you have to communicate. Like we don't talk all day long. Like it's not like, oh my God, I need to text you all day long, but we'll have like mini FaceTimes throughout the day for like five minutes. Just like, oh, how's your day? You're like, before we go to bed, we'll have like a FaceTime and we just use FaceTime a lot. Like we don't really text yeah. that much. It's really just like FaceTiming throughout the day. Um, and I think that that has been really helpful actually like seeing and hearing the person rather than just like texting through a screen all day. Um, so I think communication is like the biggest thing. And then obviously with long distance, like you have to trust the person a lot. And I think you should trust your boyfriend or girlfriend regardless, long distance or not long distance. But especially in long distance, like if trust is not there, like you will drive yourself crazy. So you definitely have to like be very, very trusting with that person. A hundred percent. Yeah. I think, um, communication is key. I mean, even if you're not long distance, communication is key. Um, Mm -hmm. that's how you have a successful relationship, but I think, um, yeah, there's like such a stigma with long distance and like, oh yeah, long distance never works. Like you said, it's going to work if you want it to work. Like if Mm -hmm. you put the effort in, it's going to work and you're going to be fine. Um, so I totally agree. Do you guys have any plans to like move to the same city anytime soon? Or are you just trying to see like with COVID, like what you guys want to do or how's that been? Yeah. So uh, I think it's like eventually, obviously we want to be in the same place. Cause like we can't be long distance forever. So yeah. like, <laughs> I definitely think like eventually we will be, but he is not really tied to Boston and in like an emotional way. Like, it's not like, oh my God, he loves Boston. He's never leaving or like his family's there. Like his family's not even in in Boston. They're in Connecticut. So like, I think eventually he's going to move to New York and like, he really does like New York a lot. And he's talked about that before. It's just a matter of like jobs and that timeline working out. So I I don't really want to like uplift my life to move somewhere that like one, I don't really like that much. Like, I mean, I like Boston, but like, I just like it because he's there. Like, I don't really like have any friends or I have a few friends but like it's not like a place I would ever live if he wasn't there so I don't really want to uplift my life for some place that he's not even going to be for a long time probably so I'm like I'll just we'll just wait and see like where life takes us but I don't think he's going to be in Boston forever and he doesn't really want to be in Boston forever so I'm like eventually we'll find either New York Charlotte or some other city but like as of now I don't really want to like uplift my life and move yeah just for that yeah <laughs> that's fair that's fair All right. Well, I think that um, wraps up today's episode. Thank you so much for coming on and talking with me. I just feel like you are such like a bright light in the YouTube world. You're so positive and genuine. And um, I want people to like watch you if they're not following you on anything. So where can people find you? Where can people listen to your podcast? All of that. Well, thank you so much. This was such a good episode. I feel like I talked about a lot of things that I don't normally talk about. So It was really great. Um, But you can find me just with my name, Natalie Barbu. So Natalie Barbu is on Instagram, YouTube, everything. That's just my name. And then the Real Real Podcast is my podcast. So that's pretty much it. Awesome. Okay. Well, yeah, follow Natalie on all social media and I will link like all of your stuff um, in the description of this, but thank you guys so much for listening. Be sure to follow Natalie on Instagram and girl, we got to talk podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for listening. Bye.